Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is part four of our series on how local governments can support community composting. Uh, today we're talking about a menu of options from zoning, grants, contracts, things that you can do if you're a local government entity to support community composting. So welcome. Um, I want to just say um, introduce uh, in addition to me I'm Brenda Platt I'm the director of the composting for community initiative here at the Institute for local self-reliance and I'm joined by my colleague Megan Matthews who will be helping a uh, variety of ways but primarily putting links in the chat and um, and also helping us with your questions which we hope you will start asking at any time in the uh, go to webinar control panel everybody is in listen only mode today and uh, the, you will get a copy or a link to the recording of uh, this webinar quick shout out to our main sponsor today the 11th hour project they've been a strong support Sp uh, supporter of our work on the composting for community initiative that we're doing here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. As I mentioned, this is part four in a series. Um, Megan will put the links to the previous three webinars we did. The first one was a spotlight just on New York City. Then we had part two, which focused on food scrap collectors and community composters that have municipal contracts. And then part three focused on a few local governments around the country and the public-private partnerships they have. Uh, today's presenters are Tyler Farmer from the San Diego County Sustainability Planning Division, California, uh, joined with Jessica Toth, Solana Center for Environmental Innovation, also in San Diego. Jessica uh, will have to leave early, so after they present, we're going to take a few questions and then we'll continue with uh, Lisa Leota in Vermont and then Scott Kell Kellogg from Radix Ecological Sustainability Center in Albany, New York. Um, more on them. Um, I want to just say a few words about our work cultivating community composting here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We are organizing an in-person forum as part of the U.S. Composting Council Conference in Ontario, California in January. Uh, we do virtual workshops. We um, I have a coalition if you're a community composter and a very active Google group. We produce guides, we have training, we have videos, so please check, check that out. A lot of our web webinars are already recorded. You can have access to them. They range from equipment for small-scale sites to uh, composting with worms and, and, and business models. The next webinar that we have planned is next month, and it's going to focus on the role of farms in decentralized composting. It's doing something different this time. It's going to be a focus on a couple of other countries, so hope you can tune in for that. And Megan, again, will put the link in the chat. We have a unique opportunity um, to help uh, elevate uh, best practices in community composting through our online training program. And we have specific projects currently this year. In, and this is available to anybody anywhere. But if you happen to be in New England or the Mid-Atlantic region of the United States, we are trying to open up the course to uh, folks and communities or serving communities chronically disenfranchised. So please contact us if you're interested, you know folks that would be interested in this online trading. Um, so, okay, we produced a lot of infographics. I think a number of you have seen them. This is one that we have produced that has this lens of local. So, um, of course, we want to reduce food waste. This is kind of a, a hierarchy of strategies for how you can handle food waste. We want to prevent it and we want to rescue edible food. But after that, Let's see if we can keep it local before we move into centralized options. So today, that's what we're talking about, is how can we support small-scale, decentralized, distributed composting, and how can local government in particular support that? So we're going to get started in one minute, but before that, do that, we're going to run a poll to see who's on the line um, today. So Megan, if you could run the poll. And it should pop up. Okay, so what best describes your affiliation? Are you a community composter, a food scrap collection service provider, local government, state or federal government, or do you fall into the other category? And okay, you guys are good. We're already up to 80% of you voting. 
and climbing. All right, let's close the poll, Megan, and show the results. All right, I think we're reaching our target audience. 48% of you represent local government. Um, and we have a number of community composters and other. Thank you all, no matter where you're joining from, for joining today. All right, we can um, close that. And um, let me just uh, now introduce, um, oh, that was the question. I want to say before I introduce Tyler, going to go first, that we did a census of community composters earlier this year. We're getting ready to release it before the end of the year. But one of the questions we asked is, what kind of public and or private sector assistance would be most useful to your operation? And probably not surprising, it was policies to encourage composting. I know you might not be able to read this, but this tall bar is policies to encourage composting. Zoning assistance was on there, Tyler. Made the list. Um, but then we also have grants, um, uh, grant writing assistance, funding and financing is huge. Contracts is also on there. Long-term access to land is a big one. So just want to kind of give a flavor of where if you're a local government, you might be able to help community composters. All right, so without further ado, let us get started. So our first speaker is um, is uh, Tyler Farmer. As I said, he's a planning manager with the San Diego County Sustainability Planning Division. Um, and uh, he'll talk about how San Diego is changing its zoning or has changed its zoning now to facilitate decentralized composting, including um, on-farm, including on-farm composting opportunities as well as other opportunities. So let me give you um, Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Brenda and Megan, for, for having me here. I'm glad to see there are a lot of local government people attending today. Um, I'm hoping that what I share today um, can be helpful for others that are interested in the same items. Let me see um, if I can figure out how to share. And I know we just went over this. Um, all right, here we go. All right. And the rest of us can turn our videos off. So here goes. Okay. Um, all right, so and then um, uh, Brenda, I'm going to think you are now seeing the full screen one. Is that correct? Uh, not in full screen mode yet. OK, so let me let me try that again. All right. So. OK. I think we're almost there. How about that one? There you go. Perfect. Full screen. All right. Thanks. And I know we just practiced it, but yes, I appreciate it. So um, yeah, um, again, you know, thanks for the introduction. My name is Tyler Farmer from the County of San Diego. Um, and for today, you know, the menu of options, zoning, grants, and contracts, I am going to be covering the zoning piece. Um, you know, like Brenda indicated, we have just recently updated our zoning um, code over here to help facilitate composting. Um, it was a two-year process that just recently closed. And, you know, just for those who don't know, zoning is, the zoning code is really just help defining what type of activities can occur in what areas of, you know, wherever you have your governance. It also can indicate what procedures and permits um, um, these specific activities must go through. So the changes that we made were just really looking to make composting easier within the unincorporated county of San Diego. So I'll go over these changes and how we approached it, um, but getting organic material, and I'm sure many people on this call know, you know, there are food material, green material, agricultural materials out of the landfill, you know, they support our waste diversion goals. You know, reducing that methane that come out supports our climate action planning efforts. And that's at the county, we have a goal to establish actions for net zero carbon emissions um, by 2035 to 2045. And also within the county um, region more broadly, we have a regional decarbonization effort to achieve zero carbon emissions by mid-century. All of the changes we made from this project support these efforts, but most importantly, it, this project is really what our community wanted and what our stakeholders were interested in, which is more access to composting, more access to community composting, and really just making it easier and more accessible. So I'll kind of quickly go over here. Um, what you're going to see on this first slide is um, 
a diagram that shows the way the old zoning ordinance impacted how organic materials were managed. And you'll see on this slide that we have orange lines that show when organic materials were going to the landfill. We have green lines that show when organic materials were diverted from the landfill. Um, we also show our major generators here, which in the unincorporated county is our farms, our residents, our business and restaurants, and our community gardens play a part too. So before we implemented this project in the old zoning ordinance, the system was really reliant on centralized large facilities, either landfill or very large organic materials processing plants. So it's obviously a big part of it. And first and foremost, our farmers were allowed to manage their own organic materials on their own sites. But if they had excess materials, didn't have the space, or for whatever reason couldn't manage their own materials compost on site, all the excess materials either went to the landfill or to that centralized facility. In a similar fashion, our residents could do backyard composting, but they could not accept any materials from their neighbors or anybody else. And again, excess materials are going to the landfill or a centralized facility. Our businesses and restaurants were just highly relying on the centralized system as well, didn't have the option for processing materials on their site. So again, landfill or centralized large um, organic material composting um, site. And our community gardens did have community, uh, did have composting on site, but it was only limited to the community garden members. Um, it did not um, allow for the acceptance of materials from non-community garden members. So that was the framework that we started with. So we went out, we did a lot of public outreach and engagement, um, try to determine what we need to do. And through this, we did virtual and in-person community presentations. We did a ton of site visits to farms, um, community compost and, and others. We did a bunch of presentations at compost training events and larger symposiums. And we really, and most importantly, had focused conversations with our environmental community and industry stakeholders to really just get a better understanding of what they wanna see out of a new system and how we can help support that. And a lot of the feedback we received is, they wanted to make sure the changes that we're making matched up with what the state of California was doing. So when people are looking to set up a composting practice, anything they do locally with the county matches up with what they're going to do for the state, you know, really reducing their paperwork burden. Our farmers were really just making sure that their current allowance for being able to manage their own materials on their own site didn't get interrupted. So we we're very sensitive to that. Um, but overall, there's really an interest in expanding community composting and really facilitating a sharing of materials um, and making that easier. Um, we did have some feedback that, you know, public health and safety is important, reducing, you know, the issues of nuisance and other items. So we layered in some best management practices to help, help protect about that. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on some of that, some of our training as well. And, and overall, there was you know, a desire to reduce the kind of permit requirements and make composting more accessible. Um, and our farmers, more specifically, really showed uh, that they're facing a burden with increasing costing for hauling their organic materials off their site. Some farmers were saying some of their hauling costs have tripled over the last 10 to 15 years. So we took all of this feedback, layered into the project, and made changes towards zoning ordinance to really help facilitate this. So let's get to you know, a similar diagram that we showed the old conditions, but now this diagram is gonna show the changes we made and how it impacts how organic materials can move and be managed within an incorporated county. Again, same lines, same generators, but you'll see a little bit of a different outcome here. First and foremost, farmers will be able to manage their own materials on their own site. We didn't change that, but now we're allowing farmers to connect with other farmers to share materials and share that resulting compost. They can do this with no permit, no barriers. So a farmer on one side of the street that might have a really great nitrogen type product, maybe some manure or someone, something else can connect with a farmer down the street who might have that carbon-based product. Um, you know, those the agricultural trimmings or others. You know, really kind of common sense and helping facilitate that and making sure that, you know, we don't get in the way and that can be easy. But again, if for whatever reason they can't make these partnerships, there's always the centralized system to help manage this. But we also made changes on the commercial side. Previously, we were really relying on the large facilities, but we created a lot of options for small and medium commercial facilities as well, and really reducing permit requirements, costs, and schedule impacts to set those up. 
on the residential side, protecting the residents' ability to do backyard composting. But now we opened it up to the community composting as well. So now residents can receive materials from their neighbors um, and, um, and help facilitate that in the residential setting. Additionally, the residents can now also bring their materials to a farm or maybe a community garden as well. And on the farm, we opened it up to not only the community composting that you see here, but we also gave farmers a new commercial type of activity as well, if they're so interested in setting that up. And again, always having the centralized option as well. Our businesses and restaurants now can bring the materials to farms, community gardens, and other options. And then lastly, our community gardens, again, can support those community gardeners themselves, but if they're so interested, then they can open up to non-community garden members as well. So hoping, you know, kind of what you see here is a more kind of decentralized system. We still have those fallbacks of the larger facilities, but we have smaller and medium-sized facilities, and then more connections just between the generators as well. And we achieved all of this through zoning ordinance changes. And since today is really about the community composting part, just wanted to do a couple slides that show, you know, what I call cut sheets of our community composting allowances that we have now. And this first one is community composting as it relates to our residential and agricultural settings, the on-farm settings. Just want to break these down in a little bit more detail. Here, we can have green and vegetative food that can be processed for composting in these settings. If it's on a farm, they can also include agricultural materials. On the community composting scale, we, we kept it limited and smaller in scale, about 20 cubic yards, and we got that volume based on a lot of feedback from community composters in our region. But we wanted to make this accessible and easy, so this comes with no permits, but we do ask that they follow some, some best practices to make sure the operational and siting criteria really reduce those nuisance and other items. And for the community composting, we didn't want it to turn into de facto commercial. So we really limited the sales of the compost, but they can donate those com that compost product out. And a very similar setup in our community gardens. Um, however, our community gardens are kind of allowed broadly through the unincorporated county. So it really gives an option for those that maybe live in an apartment setting or another option and they can't do it in their residence. Um, so now they can have access maybe to go down the street to the community garden to have them um, accept their materials. We expanded materials here a little bit more to include not only green ag and vegetative food, but also processed food as well. And the volume increased a little bit um, within this community garden setting. Again, still no permits, trying to make it accessible and easy, um, but still having some of those best practices. And kind of lastly here to support the changes and to really help encourage good practices, we have a lot of uh, compost training that is available to those who are interested. Um, our Department of Public Works, um, through its connection with um, the Solana Center for Environmental Innovation, and that includes Jessica, who will be going next here, they conduct these compost trainings. Um, through this, they're providing over 20 workshops and trainings annually in each of these events, range in different techniques from small to mid-scale, composting for residents, farmers, livestock owners, um, and many others. So it's really just helping um, facilitate this. And we do have programs for rebates um, for composting and vermicomposting containers. That's kind of the quick overview of what we've done here for zoning and changing. Um, yeah, always will be available for questions later, but if anybody wants to get more details, I'll share my information too and um, we can connect in a, in a different setting if you want to go through all the lovely details of how to, how to get your zoning ordinance changed. Thanks, Tyler. Um, while I'm getting uh, Jessica um, uh, as a presenter so she can get her slides, will you be able to make uh, send us a link to the zoning ordinance or maybe even put it in the chat if you've got that um, so that we could uh, share that out? I think people would be interested in the actual details of the ordinance. Would be happy to. Yeah, I'll share that out. Um, we have links to each of the ways we changed it, include some of the forms that you can support to, you know, get people to apply and do items and practice requirements and a lot of other resources. Happy to share that out and I'll try and get a link here while we still got the webinar going. Okay. 
Um, one thing, uh, Jessica, before you start and I introduce you, I forgot to mention at the beginning that you can earn U.S. Composting Council continuing education credits for participating in today's webinar. So I just put the link. We're not in charge. ILSR is not in charge of certifying those or whatever, approving them. So go to that link if you're interested. But um, uh, that's just something you have an option for. And um, uh, keep your – oh, there we go. Um, if you have questions for Tyler and then Jessica, we're going to take a few minutes after Jessica speaks to take those questions on San Diego and the ordinance. Jessica Toth is the executive director of the Solano Center for Environmental Innovation based in San Diego, and she's going to share developments in policy in San Diego, maybe beyond the ordinance, um, the zoning ordinance changes, but also greater California, some of those uh, policies that are removing hindrances to local composting. She's also going to touch on how multiple jurisdictions have funded her center's composting outreach and education, other initiatives over many years, which I think is very important. So, Jessica, the mic is yours. You are muted. Um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm not seeing the same screen you all are, so please confirm you've got my um, presentation. Uh, yes. It says compost program. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Wonderful to, to follow Tyler's um, presentation. I can't uh, emphasize enough how important the work is that he did, and, and I will emphasize it during my presentation. But first, I want to share a secret with all of you, uh, my new 100 plus friends that I'm meeting here. When I started at Solana Center almost 10 years ago, there are two facts that I did not know that I've since learned. And one of them is that food scrap in the landfill creates significant greenhouse gases. And the other is that when you harvest produce, you mine minerals and nutrients from the soil that belong back in the soil. So if you knew those facts already, thank an environmental educator like the woman on the right there who um, is our director of uh, education programming, um, but also recognize, I recognize that there's been an increasing awareness of these issues, um, which frankly makes my job a lot easier. The benefits of composting very briefly, avoid greenhouse gases, build healthy uh, soils, reduce agricultural water use, sequester carbon, and most recently comply with our state California legislation. Very briefly, um, uh, just very briefly about Solana Center. We're a nonprofit. Uh, we focus on soil, water, and waste. We service the 19 jurisdictions that make up San Diego County, which is 18 cities plus the county. Um, and we contract with over 70% of those San Diego jurisdictions, specifically on issues of composting and food waste. Uh, we provide education, outreach, and consulting to residents, businesses, and those government entities. And as an example, last year we trained 600 composters through our master composter course and workshops, not just through our contract with the county, but others as well. We answered 700 hotline questions, and if you didn't get the pun, those are hotline questions for um, organic material. Uh, we do run our own community composting drop-off program on site, which diverted last year 35,000 pounds of organics. Um, and over, uh, over 300 businesses have received technical assistance and inspection services for food waste um, disposal. That's a little bit about Solana Center. This is a framework that I put together a couple of years ago, and it may be um, insightful for some of you, particularly those of you um, from the government sector. Um, our work as uh, environmentalists is really to get the awareness and the change out there. And so, you know, foundational to what we do is really the community outreach through the website, through mailers, through videos. And in this past year, we calculate, we, you know, 50,000 people received environmental compliance education and um, composting education through our social media webinars and video training. So as you can see, that lowest platform is really the widest. We're reaching the most people. But through that, we're only sort of building awareness. Um, the, the impact scale on the right-hand side um, increases as you go higher up the pyramid. Um, this is just my perspective for the work that we do. Um, following that, you know, we do one-on-one -on -one interaction. We have one-on-one -on -one interactions 
um, through booths and fairs that we attend. And there we really start changing people's attitudes. And as you can see, following further up, when we teach a workshop or a course, we're teaching fewer people, but we're starting to see behavior change. When we put in place these pilot and demonstration programs or projects that we have seeded throughout the county, both the community composting scale and residential scale, where people can go and sort of kick the tires, we're really showing them achievable norms. And, and it's really changing what people conceive that they might take on. And then at the top is the consulting work that we do, working directly with cities and businesses and the county. And there we're starting to make systemic um, change. I, I, um, I feel that we have been instrumental in encouraging some of the policy change um, that we've seen, ordinances at the city level and um, county level, for example. Um, this may be uh, a little bit small to read, but I think it'll give you an idea of the full menu of options, um, harping back to, to Brenda's um, you know, description of what this presentation would be about. Uh, so we do residential composting and through that we are supported with contracts through the cities and the county to provide subsidized compost bins and composting workshops and, and webinars and courses. We also do mid-scale or community scale, community composting scale programming. And that is supported much more with the county only contracts because it's really quite broad, but also through grants from the state. So Cal Recycle is our department in California for resource recovery and the California Department of Food and Agriculture supports, um, a, they have a program called Healthy Soils Program in which we reach um, farmers and we've worked in the last couple of years with I think a total of 13 farmers and um, been able to funnel uh, almost a million dollars um, that may be over exaggerating it. It's about $800,000 for them to do composting projects on their farms. Um, this really, again, it's to give you sort of the, the diversity in the mix that, that we work with. Um, for our food waste diversion, we're working directly with the cities and the counties, and, and much of that is specific to the state law that you may be familiar with, SB 1383, um, that went into effect in January. And so we are working heavily also with the counties, with the county and the cities, um, and much of the funding for that comes from a Cal Recycle grant directly to those jurisdictions, and they're turning it over to us to, um, to support their work. And near and dear to my heart is the, um, the, the stretch programming. And with that, um, in the last couple of years, we designed what we call a mid-scale training and demonstration center. That was supported by our county board of supervisors with a large grant. Um, everybody's interested in the underserved and indigenous communities and supporting um, those communities which are a big factor, um, particularly in our region. And then we have the innovative pilot programs, which I will be giving an example of. Um, but as you can see, the funding is um, none to, to scarce. Um, and so I think I just covered basically the points that I have on this slide, funding sources, they are coming, they all have various goals, which is why it's sort of a patchwork. Um, all the funders um, are concerned with those that are underserved. We may go into um, a school and ask the students, what are the three R's? Certain schools know reduce, re use, recycle. Other schools, they've never been given this education. So we have a very strong push to reach those communities. And then funding for the innovation space is scarce. Um, now, I have a, a thesis here, and that is that policy change is the forerunner to real funding availability. Um, SB 1383, in my view, is a prime example of policy leading those funds. Uh, before this state legislation came along, we really were working with those early adopters, people who were motivated to make change, um, almost you know, one at a time with our courses and our workshops and our, our you know, going out to fairs. Um, until this policy change happened at the state level, mandating that no organic material can go to the landfill and that businesses and cities must comply, that's when we really started to see infrastructure change and true spending on, on education. Um, now I'm gonna 
switch gears a little bit. I'm going to take you back to the dark ages before Tyler's um, San Diego County Organic Materials Ordinance update happened. So let me paint a picture for you about the possibilities that that new organics um, ordinance opens up. Imagine a fast food restaurant taking its lettuce ends, its potato peels, and onion and potato and tomato scraps to be a to a farm to be composted, and that farm is just one mile away. The farm is on 67 acres of severely depleted soil, and so they'd been purchasing and hauling thousands of dollars of finished compost to amend the land, and that finished compost was coming from 25 miles away. So you may see where this is going. Now picture this new closed loop system in which materials that were generated within the community stay within the community. And in this case, this was a six month pilot program. It resulted in five times more nutrient rich compost than what they'd been hauling in, $250 a month savings for the restaurant instead of hauling to the landfill, which was 15 miles away. And in this six month pilot program, there were appreciable quantities of carbon dioxide avoided by not landfilling and by sequestering the carbon. And it was absolutely beautiful, one of the crowning achievements. These are all real photos that I have in my presentation taken either by me or some of my staff. So that arrangement that we had, that six month pilot was in 2014-15 and the county organic materials ordinance update had, you know, did not permit, the current ordinance did not permit this arrangement. So that restaurant had to go back to sending its food scrap to the landfill and the agricultural site could only create compost from the organic material that was generated on their site. Uh, testifying to the significance of this work, my organization, Solana Center for Environmental Innovation, was recognized with the state's highest environmental honor for conceiving and implementing this proof of concept program. And it was the first time that that award was given for food waste issues. Not to say that we put it on the map, but I think that's when there really started to be um, some understanding um, of the issues. So in our region, we have, believe it or not, hold your breath, capacity to manage only 12% of all the food and food soil paper that we generate in our area. That is the commercial composting facilities, the commercial anaerobic digestion facilities can only manage 12%, can manage 33% of all the organic materials. So that includes yard trimmings. So community composting and residential solutions are really an important part of the, the mix of what we need for managing our organic waste. Um, and so the, the um, policy change that Tyler spoke about is clearly very, very important for, for our region. And that sort of thinking outside of the box, decentralized composting is, is extremely important. Education and training um, requirements are gonna be, need to be baked in. And that, that's me on my, my soapbox. We definitely don't want composting to get a bad, bad rap. It wants, we wanna see it as the natural ecosystem that it is. Looking out on the horizon, imagine a large grocery store that so sources its produce from regional farms. And that store is generating dumpsters full of inedible food waste weekly. This is an actual picture from a dumpster from a local grocery store. And meanwhile, those regional farm partners that are supplying the produce to that grocery store need soil replenishment. So you probably see where I'm going. The San Diego County Incorporated areas now the grocer and the farms are now allowed to partner in a regional closed loop system that's analogous to that community system we designed and demonstrated and ran for six months, seven years ago. It's taken seven years. So we want to keep the intrinsic value that's locked in food waste in, within the region where it's generated. Um, and I'll just say this proof, th this program that I'm looking for to design with a, a regional system, a grocery store taking the organic material, the organic waste back out to the regional farms, there's no funding identified right now for this proof of concept. And so that's something that's extremely important in my view um, is, is to have that kind of support. So that is what I prepared for today. I hope that um, there was some insights there and I would love to take any questions um, for me or for, for Tyler since we work together. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. 
thank you, Jessica. And uh, for the folks who joined um, be before I made this announcement, Jessica's teaching a course, so she's going to leave early. So we're going to uh, uh, take a break in the presentations to answer some questions on the ordinance and what's going on with San Diego. And Jessica, I'm going to start off with a question for you. And um, is uh, how many people have, do you have any idea, you can ballpark this, how many people, farmers, anybody, Solana is trained that have then gone out to become these composting ambassadors that are advocating for some of the policy changes that we're seeing Tyler and others making in the in your community and beyond in California. How many people have you trained? What's oh, the importance easily. of yeah, these local governments supporting training programs? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, easily thousands. So way before my time, probably for 25 years now, we've been running the master composter course and the workshops. And we graduate about 100 master composters a year. And those folks take a five week course. And part of them getting their certification is to go back out in the community and give 30 hours of service. And we find them all over the place. We've got incredible alumni, um, both from our master composter course and um, from, you know, from our staff. But and from the workshops that we teach that are evangelizing or you know working at um, at other nonprofits, working within government. Tyler works with a uh, um, Stephanie who was a staff member um, at Solana Center before my time, but you know she uh, carries the torch and understands the importance of of composting. So um, I would say thousands, and I think that's extremely important. You know, I um, in my neighborhood. Um, where I moved uh, probably 15 years ago, I was the sole composter uh, on the block, and that was kind of considered icky. But I think, you know, just seeing over time, um, that's changing, and and people are understanding as I talk to them. And I I don't have to be wearing my heart on my sleeve and and uh, encouraging everybody to have to do this. But I think people now understand the issues of food waste that it actually is detrimental to the climate, um, and and that many people are food insecure and and it's really a crime to be wasting edible food as well yeah so, long just, brenda, brenda I'll just kind of uh mirror some stuff there you know through the effort that you know jessica not only was critical to our project and our changes here not only as a subject matter expert but the advocacy she's been doing on this topic for you know quite some time in the san diego region but when we were doing outreach and engagement so many people to us after we were talking with them, we're like, oh yeah, you should you should connect with the Solana Center. And have you talked to Jessica yet? And there's just like so much of that through the 18 months that we did outreach and engage around this effort. So she is out there, she's making an influence, and it, it's it's helpful to us on the policy side. Yeah. And, to, just, and 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 there are many organizations in our area. We have year-round growing seasons. Um, there's a group, Food to Soil, um, that has a community composter and been doing uh, the work um, for many years as well. Yeah, I'll just point out thank in the you, comments Tyler. that Jessica, you have some of your master composter graduates on the call participating today. Oh, so congratulations. <laughs> um, uh, so Tyler, we got some questions for you on the on the uh, on the ordinance. So one is maybe you can just clarify this because this point of clarification is uh, why is the restrictions for farmers seems smaller than from community gardens 20 maybe you can just clarify the 20 cubic yard threshold versus the 100 cubic yard threshold uh, so that's just on the community composting side and that's something we added later in the project you know we had community composting for this project really being facilitated in our community gardens um, and we got a lot of great feedback, um, you know, some of which from the food to soil organization that Jessica just referenced as like, hey, you really need to open this up more in the residential areas as well. And so we added that with that 20 cubic yard guidance and we applied it to our residential and any properties that have active agricultural operations. However, that's not what is limited in the farm setting. Farms can also do that partnership with other farms without limits and volumes. They also have commercial activities. So that's just one component of many components that can occur in that on-farm composting environment. So it's really just kind of a small addition for community composting, utilizing farms. There's many other ways that farms kind of play, play a role in this. Great. Um, 
can you share, uh, there was one question that came in, how does the San Diego define a farm? Is it by land size? Is it by commercial for sale products? So we have some farms that um, have established permit procedures that, you know, are, you know, this is a farm and, you know, established on books. Some of the activities we have relate to those permitted activities and some of our other kind of more accessible composting activities are just where some type of agricultural activities are occurring. So, so it varies and we have some definitions in our ordinance to help give guidance to that. Okay, great. So this may be a question for both of you, Jessica. I'll start with you. Um, is any type of training required in order to be able to participate in community composting? Not to my knowledge. That would be something that the county uh, or a city um, would impose. So it's a really good question. Uh, I'll, I'll share that when I began this job almost 10 years ago, um, I was laughed out of a um, a board of Supervisors meeting uh, when I suggested that we needed to really establish more composting facilities. And the reason being valid, uh, which is that composting had gotten a, a bad name for itself. And there are stories of 20, 30 years ago, compost piles catching on fire and uh, attract, you know, not being managed properly. So that's a, I'm very strong proponent uh, of the training and education being a clear part um, and we do have also continuing uh, education units that people can get for um, taking courses. But it's not it's not a requirement unless Tyler knows something that I don't. No, yeah, this is what I kind of, you know, add in the local government perspective. So what we did with our changes is we included these best practice requirements and those come those operational and setting requirements that I said. And those are setbacks from sensitive habit, habitat, setbacks from your neighbors, protections of waterways, um, pile height limits and many other elements. And so we have those included. And if someone's doing a practice that does create a nuisance, the county can go out and um, if they see some a practice being that's being done incorrectly we'll be providing guidance and advice and we have all these training uh, um, training programs that are set up with jessica that we can you know share um, with the uh, the operators to help them kind of bring their operation into a way that is um, you know managed successfully so it's a it's part of the the tool of options that we have and then we give guidance in the ordinance as well so just kind of like thinking about the whole community as well and not just as much compost as possible but as much successful and properly managed compost as possible and i'll just say all of our courses are subsidized such that they're free um, from the different cities and the counties that run them um, so people just have to have the motivation and the time yeah um all right, I think this is for you, Jessica. During the pilot, who covered the cost of composting and transportation of organics from businesses to farms? Well, that's a good question. I'll tell you, the project took me two years to get it started, of working with the different partners. So I got a little bit of funding from the, um, the, the fast food restaurant, a little bit of funding each month from the farm, um, and Ed Co, who is our hauler, has subsidized the cost of hauling um, between the two. Um, but it was actually supported, our time was primarily supported by um, Solana Center. It was something we felt that was very important to do. And that's why moving forward, where I wanna do this project that is, is more regional, looking at an entire grocery store and the various farmers that support them. Um, I would I need funding to um, manage those relationships and, and to get that project going. It, uh, it's a significant effort. All right, on the same thread of, of, of financing or of how the financials work, um, somebody commented or asked, it sounds like based on the new zoning changes, farmers are not allowed to charge for composting organics. How does composting on a local level work financially? Are farmers willing to process the material for free? So Tyler, why don't we start with you? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It gives me the opportunity to provide a clarification. The example I provided was just related to that community composting if a farmer wanted to help facilitate that. Um, we don't limit the business opportunity that a farmer may have to do a more commercial type of operation. And we've actually, with the zoning ordinance changes, created a lot of new allowances there. 
Um, they weren't in the cut sheets because, you know, wanted to stay focused on the community side, but I'll share a draft of the ordinance and there's a lot of different commercial activities that farmers can do. A little bit more paperwork on the county side, but we did reduce those barriers a lot as well. So there is very much a commercial opportunity for farmers and commercial opportunities for um, compost operators who are just doing like um, a standalone facility as well. So it's kind of like a part of a broader holistic change. Uh, but the cut sheets you did see were very specific to that community composting site uh, uh, type of option, which is uh, we're trying to make that be the non-commercial activity. All right, so we're gonna stop there so we can continue with our presentations. Jessica, thanks for joining us. If you do have more questions for Jessica, send them in. We'll try to see if we can get them answered when she has time. All right, so we're gonna you, move um on to let me share my screen um go full screen here all right so let me introduce um all right you can see that let me introduce lisa leota um uh, welcome, Lisa. She is the general manager of the Central Vermont Solid Waste District, Management District, and uh, she has been working on promoting all kinds of, you know, whether it's zero waste or composting in the community, and she's going to talk about a new innovative program that she was able to get started with very little investment. So one of the things we're doing today is kind of featuring a wide range of programs. If you don't think you can, you know, do a big zoning ordinance change, don't worry, there's lots of options for you. So Lisa, the mic is yours. And Great. Just let me Thank know you. Want me to advance your slides? Okay. I will do. Thanks, Brenda. It's so interesting to hear Tyler and Jessica speak about these things on a very macro level. But I'm going to bring it down to a much more local, micro level, and just say that I'm so pleased to be here today to speak with you about how our small rural government in Vermont is supporting on-farm and community composting. And the case study I'll be highlighting is one where we provided a $5,000 micro grant that has helped a local farmer to establish neighborhood compost pods in a rural Vermont town. So in July of 2020, the state of Vermont became the first state in the nation to ban all food scraps from the landfill nationwide. And while some communities like San Francisco and Seattle had previously implemented similar bans, Vermont's really quite different than a large, residentially dense, mostly urban city. And next slide, please, Brenda. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to understand not only where is Vermont, but more importantly, what is Vermont? We're a very small northeastern state located in the New England region, and we're one of the most rural states in the United States, along with Maine. About two thirds of our residents live in a rural area, and no city is greater than 50,000 people. Um, with the total population of our state, about 645,000 residents, we're a fifth the size of San Diego County. And as you can imagine, small states like ours tend to have very small government. But Vermonters value our small institutions and our highly localized solutions, while at the same time, we've been pretty bold in our legislative goals, like the food ban in 2020. Next slide, please. So generally speaking, New England states do not have active, active county government systems compared to the rest of the nation. And in fact, Vermont has no county form of government. And for the most part, citizens engage here directly with either a state office or their local municipality. And when governance concerns solid waste, there's a few more options. We have districts, which are regional governments formed by the legislature. And they're composed of member cities and towns who elect to join that district. We can levy assessments and surcharges, and that's the primary source of our funding. Another option in Vermont is an alliance, which is a group of towns and cities who come together to cooperatively manage their waste, but they have no authority to levy any assessments or any surcharges. And the last option is some towns can go at go it themselves and independently manage their solid waste. And if you look at this map here of Vermont, you can see those independent towns in yellow. Our district happens to be the teal colored um, district right in the center 
top center of the map. Yeah, that's it right there. And today we're going to be talking about a project we had in the town of Hardwick, which is the very top center part right there. Yep, that's it. Okay, next slide, please, Brenda. Thank you. So our district, the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District, is comprised of 19 member towns and small cities, including Vermont's capital city of Montpelier, which is the smallest state capital in the US with just 10,000 people. We're the second largest solid waste district in Vermont based on population. When we're fully staffed, we have 11 staff members and our annual budget is around $1.2 million. Each year, our district allocates about $30,000 for grants. And those grants are to help community groups, our member towns, schools, businesses, and other nonprofits who provide services to residents within our district in managing their various wastes, including food scraps. And depending on the type of grant, our grants can be as little as $200 or as much as $5,000. Next slide, please. So the case study I'd like to talk with you about is Black Dirt Farm. Black Dirt Farm is a diversified family farm in Northeastern Vermont that collects food scraps from their community. They forage hens, make compost and worm castings with the excess food and manure, and they use those to nourish their soils and crops. This family farm is based in regenerative agricultural practices and the creation of sustainable food systems. And I'm, I'm really thankful Jessica mentioned um, keeping those nutrients and things local and keeping those on a farm in the community from where they were generated. Tom Gilbert, the owner of Black Dirt Farms, has a long history in community composting. He's worked in composting for more than 18 years and served as the executive director of Highfield Center for Composting, where he and his team worked to develop a statewide network of local composting programs including incubating a composting program that was led by our district. And through this work, he's helped many communities build collection and processing capacity in order to retain those discarded organic materials within their own food shed. By early 2021, Black Dirt Farm was collecting from more than 85 businesses and institutions in the town of Hardwick, Vermont. And in 2021, they diverted more than 2 million pounds of food scraps from the landfill. And next slide, please. So in 2021, our district awarded a $5,000 grant to Black Dirt Farm to develop and establish a residential rural food scrap collection service in the town of Hardwick, Vermont. Hardwick is a member town of our district and they have a population of about 1,250. And in rural areas like Hardwick, these types of residential collections are pretty rare. But Black Dirt believed that with Vermont's food scrap ban in place the prior year and some creative thinking, that their program could become viable, particularly since it could be combined with their existing commercial collection routes. And the concept is really simple. So one household in a neighborhood signs up to host a 48 gallon compost tote, and then neighbors and friends sign up to drop their home food scraps in that tote for a small fee. And I think currently it's about $2 per week. Um, pod members source separate their food scraps from other waste, and they can empty into that tote at their convenience. Maybe it's on their way to work, on their way to taking their kids to school or the grocery store, um, or just a fun activity with their kids. And it, it's totally up to them. And then Black Dirt picks up that tote once a week and replaces it with a new tote that's been completely power washed and clean. Um, this pod system has saved money, fuel, and time. And it has helped make composting a real community effort. Um, and it's also increased accessibility for neighbors to be able to easily compost their food scraps. And it's a great opportunity for neighbors to increase their contact and collaboration with each other um, and build local community, which is something that Vermonters highly value. Next slide, please. Um, this project has really been a collaboration between Black Dirt Farm, our district, and the town of Hardwick. Uh, this is a advertisement page from the town of Hardwick's website. Um, again, with a population of 1,250. 
And um, oops, I got to move to my own next slide here. So we're still learning a little bit about this program and how we can make this really work. And some of the things that really help is to have a really good site leader, really clear communication and signage, an effective recruitment of subscribers. But because Vermont is small, we tend to place a lot of bets on creative initiatives. And this is just one of those. Can you go to the next slide, please, Brenda. Our district has also helped to promote the program by our various channels. Um, here's an image and a post from our social media page, Instagram and Facebook. And we believe that by providing seed money to Black Dirt Farm and others, our schools, towns, and organizations, by our grant programs, even though they're, they can be quite small, it helps us fulfill our mission, which is to provide education, advocacy, and services for district residents and business in reducing and managing their solid waste in order to help protect public health and the environment. The next slide, please. Thank you. So in addition to these small micro grant programs, our district also provides our communities with composting support in many other ways. Our staff produced the Dirt on Compost publication and guidebook, which is available on our website um, and also as a hard copy that we send out to our residents. We present on-site composting workshops and webinars. We provide home composting equipment to residents in our district at a much reduced cost. We also provide technical assistance to landlords, businesses, and residents. And we have a dedicated staff member who is in schools and provides educational programs to 26 public schools within our district. Um, and we also provide tips and guidance and plans for constructing composting units on our website. Next slide, please. Um, and that's kind of a story of what our district has done on a very local level to support community composting. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to share the story with you today and how our small regional government has been able to partner with the family farm to expand community composting. Um, we believe that small can be beautiful and not every initiative or funding support needs to be large to be effective. And from the outset, one of our goals for this partnership was to foster the development of a type of program that was new that hopefully could be adopted in other communities within our district throughout Vermont and beyond. And I hope our story provides some inspiration and fosters your own creative approaches for how you might spur community composting in your area. And particularly by looking at public-private partnerships on a lot of different scales. And thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I love that it's seed money to grow pods. <laughs> So much. All right, so we're not going to take questions for Lisa right now. Tyler will join us at the end. We're going to move right on to Scott Kelly. Let me just give you Scott presentation, make you panelists. There we go. You should be able to bring up your slides. And while you're doing that, I will introduce you. So Scott Kellogg is the educational director for the Radix Ecological Sustainability Center in Albany, New York. Um, it's an urban eco-justice and ecological literacy nonprofit that advocates for just urban transitions. And for the last decade, he's been operating a community composting initiative. If you joined us for the last webinar, uh, part three in this series, we had Sonny Von Tiedermann from the city of Albany who talked about how the city was supporting community composters and one of them he mentioned was Radix and so I just knew we had to have Radix on directly to talk about what they're doing so Scott welcome the mic is yours great thanks so much can everybody hear me okay yep and we can see your slides and you can see the slides fantastic all right thank you all so much uh thank you Brenda for the introduction like you said yeah my name is Scott I'm the educational director of the Radix Ecological Sustainability Center, which is a nonprofit organization based in Albany, New York. That's probably about where 90% of my work is done. 
I'm also a professor at Bard College's Center for Environment and Policy and in SUNY Albany's uh, Master's in Regional Planning Program. I'm the chair of the Urban Agriculture Committee for the City of Albany's Sustainability Advisory Committee. So I have a foot in the academic and policy realms, but primarily situate myself within a community-based organization framework. So um, yeah, like Brian had mentioned, uh, Radix is a nonprofit urban environmental education center. We have a one acre demonstration site of sustainable tools and technologies in the south end of Albany. It's designed to teach urban residents with a special focus on youth how to have greater local access and control over essential resources such as food, water, waste management, energy production, with an emphasis on building systems that are simple and affordable with the goal of coming up with a model that is going to be transferable, replicable ultimately to cities throughout the country and the world. One thing about Albany, it's a relatively small 100,000 post-industrial second tier, if not exactly shrinking, but plateau city that has a lot in common with other proverbial Rust Belt towns in a social, economic, and environmental sense. So if we come up with a functional model here, there's a good chance that it's going to be transferable to other locations. So we focus a lot on teaching ecological literacy, having greater familiarity with how to grow food, how to process waste, how to produce electricity, have a relationship with the non-human world, things that many times is a consequence of living in cities kids and young people may be disconnected from even though we're a small city that's surrounded by farms and fields and forests if you don't have a car those places aren't going to be accessible to you nor are you going to feel necessarily culturally welcoming in those locations so we think there's a value to having green space ecological space agricultural space integrated into a high density urban environment so do a lot of programs in school districts uh have a good partnership with the albany school district where we're doing garden-based education and composting education in a number of their elementary schools, as well as having regular visits at the Radix site. We also run a youth after-school program, employment program where high school age students come and are paid to help manage the systems at Radix while also understanding the relevance of it and how it connects to local environmental justice issues. That turns into a whole five-week summer employment program that we do with the high school students that we run concurrently with an AmeriCorps program. So we have undergraduate age, and high school age students working around community-based participatory learning goals at the Radix Center. So we really look at compost and composting as it relates to soil and uh, as, as soil is a limiting factor to food production within urban environments. So urban soils tend to be often non-existent degraded or contaminated. Non-existent meaning they've been paved over with asphalt and concrete. Uh, degraded, even if you do tear up that asphalt or concrete, that the soil underneath is highly contaminated, uh, has an absorptive capacity that is um, slightly better than asphalt itself, highly compressed, starved of uh, moisture and oxygen and life, um, or it, it may be contaminated uh, quite frequently with lead, which is a ubiquitous urban contaminant, a consequence of uh, industry being located inside of cities over the past 150 years, and soils being a sink quite often for that contamination. Fortunately, the solution to any of these problems is right at our fingertips in the form of all the organic matter that is currently going into the landfill each day, where it's breaking down anaerobically and turning into methane gas, which is, of course, driving climate change, which is disproportionately impacting residents in low-income, formerly redlined environmental justice communities in cities, which are already as much as 10 degrees warmer as a consequence of the preponderance of impervious cover and a uh, lack of tree cover. So what we really wanna be doing is intercepting that food waste and composting it aerobically on the surface of the planet, turning it into fertilizer, which we're gonna be using to grow nutrient-dense food for populations of people in food desert food apartheid communities in urban environments. So composting can build soil where it doesn't exist. It can revitalize it by serving as a microbial inoculant for a soil that's been starved of moisture and oxygen, can help with its moisture retaining capacity. And in instances where it's been contaminated, it's very useful too because it's creating a physical barrier 
that separating people from contaminated soil that may be beneath. It's preventing uh, that contaminated soil from becoming dried out and dust borne and being deposited on vegetables via aerial deposition. And in the case of lead, it, it, lead can get bound up within the molecular structure of compost. So its biological availability is reduced. Therefore, were accidentally ingested, it's more apt to pass through your body rather than to stick to receptor sites in your brain. So we think a lot about this idea of compost justice, uh, looking at compost and composting through the lens of environmental justice, asking questions like who composts, who has access to food waste, what is that compost ultimately used for? Like the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we're big advocates of decentralized and horizontally distributed community-based composting uh, strategies preferencing small and community scale projects, which are ultimately more democratic, concentrating the power of, of, of composting technology into many versus fewer hands. And of course, ultimately using the end product of compost to promote the regeneration and detoxification of urban soils. I'm a big advocate of repurposing vacant lots, which we have an abundance of in second tier cities like Albany, as composting sites and essentially doing in-situ remediation on site. I'll also mention this is also integrated into our educational programs. We really teach about composting as being a, a part of a cycle with food production and really important for youth and visitors or site to understand both as points along the cycle. And that way really, if, if all other grant funding were to fall through, we could fall back on those two things which are core to our educational mission the production of, of, of food, which is part of our farm share programming and our composting business, which bring in small yet reliable sources of income for the organization. So the Radic Center has been running a community composting initiative since 2009. It's grown very slowly from having about 10 customers to currently over 150. And um, we really encourage composting to happen on every level in the city number one at home setting up a compost pile in the backyard for people who have a backyard setting up a worm bin if you don't have a backyard which is an instance in many identity urban environments we also have a free drop-off bin in the front of the radic center where people can drop off their food scraps at no charge and lastly for people who are willing to pay twenty dollars a month for having the convenience of curbside food scraps collection we do a weekly collection and go around with um, electric cargo bicycles and tricycles like you see here to pick up food scraps and bring them back to the rack center and it's really important for us to be using electric cargo bicycles and tricycles as they are legally classified as bicycles there's no overhead of costs associated with um licensing registration um permits and very importantly whoever's driving them doesn't need to be licensed so a lot of potential there for job creation also very important in high density urban environments where we have asthma rates of approaching 30 40 percent to try and get away from internal combustion and reduce the amount of particulate emissions that we produce so what these are, are affordable electric vehicles uh, electric vehicles are, are still very much out of the price range of organizations like ours so these um you know, create a more affordable link. And and from a practical standpoint, make collection so much easier because these tricycles can go up on the sidewalk and pick up uh, two and a half gallon containers really rapidly. You don't have to struggle with trying to find a parking spot for it. So this program has been going on for, um, for about 10 years. Uh, we process our food scraps in a number of different ways. We use uh, traditional static passive composting methods. We also employ micro livestock, which is really a fancy word for chickens and ducks to eat our food scraps. We have a whole team of them, probably about 40 chickens and ducks, and we wheel in the food scraps and feed them to them. They do an amazing job of reducing the volume of those food scraps, producing chicken manure, which is a fantastic fertilizer, and then upcycling those nutrients into eggs, which is a pretty cool trick that really only living organisms can do. Most of what we call recycling is actually form of downcycling, turning into something that has less value than what you began with. Uh, living things can do the opposite. 
So those eggs are sold as part of our farm share operation. And um, we never really have to buy commercial feed for the chickens either. And they get a very diverse uh, and healthy diet. And we treat the chicken yard pretty much like a compost pile, mixing in uh, carbon-based materials, wood chips primarily, and as it fills, periodically digging it out and composting that and turning that into soil. So this program has been ongoing for about 10 years. And initially, the city of Albany was um, neutral to opposed about the idea of it. They had just invested money in a methane recovery system in the landfill. And their attitude was that they wanted to essentially feed the beaks, that all organics should go into the landfill so as to produce revenue generating methane. And I said, what percentage of that methane are you capturing? And they said, maybe 3%, the rest is fugitive. Uh, methane recovery systems, I, I suppose, are good on existing landfills, but should never be used as a justification for continuing to put food scraps in the landfill. However, this has changed over time. Uh, pressure has grown from the public and an increasing awareness by the work of a lot of environmental educators to let people understand the connection between composting and environmental justice. That has, um, yeah, put pressure on the city to, to actually come around to embrace composting and to be supporting it. So um, in um, 2018, uh, myself, as well as a, a team of people, Tina Lieberman, um, wrote a grant in partnership uh, with the city of Albany that funded the position of a composting educator. And the city received that grant and uh, the contract was awarded to Radix. And we've ever since been doing the work of composting education, primarily at public events, but really getting the word out to local residents about all the different options for composting, whether they are, you know, at the backyard, the, the city provided people with um, free earth machines and with uh, two and a half gallon composting containers to let people know about the existing drop-off sites for one of two within the city of Albany, and also about different organizations that are doing curbside collection. So the, it's interesting that the city chose rather than to centralize compost pickup and make it a municipal service to really just support the community-based and grassroots organizations that were already in the process of doing this work, which um, I am appreciative of. So this is a sign that the city of Albany constructed and uh, placed down at the Radix Center that instructs people about what should and should not go into the food scraps drop-off bin. Interesting also that they, they've essentially branded it by calling it Albany Composts, which um, to me is 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 an indicator of cultural transformation. The fact that you have a municipality that previously opposed something has come around to wholeheartedly embrace it within a 10 year period is, is a sign of progress for sure. Uh, there are now regular press events at this. Here is um, the, the Kathy Sheen, the mayor of Albany, uh, celebrating the the, 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 initiate, the the initialization of the Albany Compost Program. And uh, more recently, um, here's uh, Basil Segos, uh, head of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, in announcing a new round of funding uh, to promote composting specifically in environmental justice communities. So it's an interesting story of how a, what began as a community-based organization and grassroots initiative has grown into something that has been wholeheartedly been embraced by municipal and by state government and how this, you know, maybe a replicable model in other locations as well. So just to um, to finish up here, um, a handful of policy recommendations um, to ensure that the needs of environmental justice communities are prioritized in, in drafting composting policy, really to really make sure that we are maximizing what we can do with composting, composting, in environmental justice communities, particularly for the purpose of food production and soil remediation before it is being outsourced in any way, preferencing compost, composting strategies that are decentralized, local, and community-based. Um, consider supporting the existing efforts of community-based composting initiatives rather than centralized municipal operations or outsourcing to large corporations. Adequately compensate community-based organizations. Don't assume they will do this work purely out of love. This is really important. Oftentimes, governmental agencies 
uh, are looking to save money and will put responsibilities onto the backs of nonprofits and community-based organizations, thinking they will work purely out of the level of what they do, which is true. However, this is unfair. They need to be adequately compensated for their work and shouldn't be used um, as an austerity measure. Um, draft MOUs with community-based organizations when partnering on grants to ensure that they don't get cut out of programs after funding has been received. It happens way too often that municipalities will describe partnerships with grassroots organizations in grant applications and then ultimately cut them out of the program once the funding has been received. This is unacceptable. You will destroy the trust uh, between yourself and community-based organizations. So in order to protect the interests of grassroots organizations, it's important that legal documents be drafted. Finally, provide material supports uh, wood chip delivery um, on demand is really essential for these operations to be successful. This is a, a critical component. And um, that's about it. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Scott. Those are um, such important um, recommendations to make on so many different levels. And um, I think for those who represent local government who are on this webinar, the benefits you get from supporting community-based organizations like RADx, you know, it's the youth engagement, it's addressing the vacant lots, it's creating the jobs, the skills, the culture of composting know-how. I mean, the benefits just go on and on when you keep it local. So you are speaking our language, Scott. If you wanna stop sharing your screen and we could have all the um, presenters uh, who's still with us, turn their videos on, that would be awesome. Um, and uh, we ha and keep your questions coming in. We, have, we actually have 14 minutes left um, uh, for questions. So Scott, I'll just start with you. There's one question that came in, quick question. Do you remain active through the winter season? Yeah, we never stop. We um, keep accepting food scraps. And honestly, in many ways, the winter is easier because the food scraps have typically been frozen, which makes them smell less. Um, much easier than the summer where, especially with curbside drop-off, you can have people who have food scraps that have been sitting around for three or four weeks before they finally drop them off, and they smell so bad. So we really ask people to commit to at least weekly drop-off. Either do that, or please freeze your food scraps before you drop them off so you don't disrespect the whole neighborhood. Um, but yeah, in you know, a compost pile, really, as long as you have sufficient mass, I've regularly measured uh, core temperatures of passive piles in 90 degrees even when they're completely frozen on the outside. So yeah. it's just make sure that you're getting the right carbon to nitrogen ratios and um, eventually it will warm up again and the composting process will continue. One of my favorite videos, Lisa, is actually from Vermont with some of those uh, guys. Um, doing one of the pain piles with the tubes and heating up, uh, using the heat from the compost pile to heat a hot tub in the winter with surrounded by snow. I don't know if you have any comments on winter or composting while we're on that topic, but. Well, it just gets very cold here. We can have regular temperatures, you know, 30, 30 below zero, you know, for some periods of time. So yeah, everybody's pile freezes, but you know, we ask folks to just save lots of browns save your leaves, save your stuff in bags, it'll warm back up. Yeah, and you know, some of the farms in Vermont, they're capturing the heat off their compost piles to heat their greenhouses and their barns. So when you keep it local, you get all these other benefits, you know, renewable energy too, right? Um, I'm gonna put in the link, I'm glad Scott, you mentioned the importance of home composting. We did a report a few years ago, which is actually a guide for local government on home composting programs. And one of the things that's I think really relevant to the discussion today is there's a whole chapter on just archaic ordinances that need to be fixed, whether it's local zoning or not, that prevent people from composting. And there was a question, uh, Tyler, for you just to clarify, see if I can find it here, that you're allowing um, neighbor to neighbor exchange of food scraps, which is one of the things that we highlighted in that guide that some ordinances prevent neighbors from getting together to do this activity. Can you comment on that? Yeah, and that's just so spot on. That's exactly what we were seeing too. You know, a lot of our zoning ordinance rules that were on the books were crafted decades ago. And it just, you know, represented, 
you know, a system that doesn't match what people want to do now. And you're exactly correct. Previously, you were able to compost your own household materials in your backyard, but that was it. And if you wanted to get your neighbor's materials, you needed a permit that took you like two years and, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. We're like, okay, well, this is an easy fix. We need to get rid of this. We need a lot of neighbors to connect with neighbors to compost and we need to stay out of the way. So that was one of the, one of the things that we, we, we look to address with this change here. Awesome, love that. Um... Um, okay, so um, um, Tyler, there was um, just to up, just follow up on the zoning stuff. Is there a zoning allowance for startup community composting that's not directly related to farms? Yes, there is community composting. It can be on a farm. Um, it can be in a different setting as well. It doesn't have to be facilitated through the farmer. It can be facilitated through, you know, just you know, neighbors getting together, whether that's at a residence or at a community garden, um, or it could be through a third party organization as well. So we're allowing, you know, uh, we have some third party organizations, Food to Soil, that really helps facilitate community composting, um, getting the organics connected with the site and then um, and other items too. So it, it's really open to however those want to do it. Basically what we did is we just made it possible for those that are interested to be able to do the things they want to do. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so Lisa, we have a question for you, a Vermont question. Does the farm only take, I guess it's Black Duck Farm, only take veggie food scraps or all food scraps, including processed food and compostable flatware and soiled paper? How much non-food, non-compostable contamination, example plastics, do you get? And what education have you provided participants to improve contamination? Contamination oh, question, big issue in Vermont. <laughs> yeah, that's a multi-part question. <laughs> um, so I don't actually, I'm not actually on the farm. So Black Dirt Farm has partnered with us on this grant. But my understanding is they only take food scraps. They don't take anything that's compostable or any of the compostable materials. And most outlets in Vermont do not, just because we don't have those um, means to process those so i believe they're just taking food scraps um, and as far as how they communicate what they take i was not able to locate a picture of their compost pods and the signage that they have but they have constructed a really nice um, setup with real clear instructions on what to put in the bin what not to put in the bin and we're also supported by the state of vermont that has um, outreach materials and a program as well to communicate all of these things to all residents within the state. Yeah, and having, I had Tom Gilbert from Black Dirt Farm on one of our podcasts. We can uh, put the link in the chat if we have time or send it out later, but um, it really did focus, he focused a lot on just the importance of segregation, mm -hmm. segregated, yeah. keeping materials clean. And I know as a farmer and using, producing that that black gold, to go back into you know his farm you know he's using like 18 you know more than a dozen different feedstocks to produce this really high quality product so i'm sure you know contam reducing contamination is not just an issue for him but it's an issue for composters all across the country i don't know mm -hmm. scott if you have anything you want to add to this discussion or tyler jump in what one thing i'll definitely say i think there's a value to very small scale and almost what I call microbrew composting. When you're dealing with really small batches, really like 30 gallons at a time, you have the opportunity to remove contamination by hand. When you start increasing throughput and start industrializing the process, contamination levels are inevitably going to increase. So I think another reason for decentralizing composting. Agree. Um, all right, Lisa, Another question for you, um, was the landfill ban just food scraps or yard trimmings green waste banned from the landfill as well? Yeah, we also banned um, clean wood, yard trimmings, um, anything like that is also banned from the landfill and there are separate regulations around uh, where those can go. All transfer stations do accept those in Vermont and there's a number of other outlets, but yeah, great question. Those are also banned. Okay. Um, uh, Scott, how do you separate out the chicken safe food scraps from the rest of the compost you are collecting, like coffee grounds? So I have, the, the only thing I will not feed my chickens 
is raw poultry, um, which rarely seems to appear in uh, the food waste that we collect. One, because we tell people not to put meat in. Um, I mean, you still inevitably end up with some degree of it, but we want to control the floodgate. Uh, other than that, there are things that just chickens won't eat, and they just uh, honestly get buried in wood chips and then eventually get dug out and are composted anyway. But um, if they're particularly huge, like, well, right about now, we're getting a lot of pumpkins, and we'll throw a lot of pumpkins in there. The chickens will pick out the seeds and the pulp, and then they'll leave the shells, and then we'll pull out the shells and throw those into the compost pile. And, and again, I think when you're operating a small-scale system, it's not too unreasonable to do something like that. Okay, great. And we had other questions about chickens, but um, I think, um, and what to feed them. I think just be careful about contamination, the produce stickers, the twist dyes, you know, you don't want, uh, chickens can kind of pick some of that stuff out. I think pigs are a little bit more. Uh, they, they, they don't like to eat plastic. They'll kick it aside and, you know, we'll, we'll pick it out of the yard, but I've never had a problem with a chicken apparently dying from eating a piece of plastic or anything. All right, here's a different question altogether. This is about money that's coming down the pike for infrastructure and um, other things. So is anyone accessing American Recovery Plan money for composting? Do any of you know anything about that? Tried. You tried, failed? Yeah. All right. In Vermont, um, okay. don't apply for, we're not the type of municipality that qualifies for ARPA funding. Um, but there are some EPA grants that are coming for infrastructure and different types of solutions uh, that have, I hear are pretty significantly funded. Tyler, did you want to jump in? I was just going to say, I would have to defer to my uh, partners in Department of Public Works who are more closely related to that. But I know in California, there are additional funding sources that come from the state government just in relation to support of implementation of Senate Bill 1383. I know that's only part of the audience that's here today, but I just didn't want to highlight that. Yeah. And Lisa's quite right about EPA funding from headquarters, it, part of the bipartisan infrastructure plan. There's $50 million a year for five years for we use recycling and composting, and that um, solicitation should be uh, announced next month sometime with probably a 60 to 90 day response time. So local government and state government will qualify, so keep an eye out, keep an eye out for that. Um, um, all right, this is probably a question, I think mostly for you, Tyler, if you can, for, but for anyone. Have any jurisdictions, county or local, established a rebate program to manage requirements for SB 1383 recycled organic materials. The reason I said Tyler, you're the only one in California on the call, on our panel right now. So, um, and specifically, okay, I'll, let's just ask. Do you, do you know anything about that? Um, yeah, I guess I'm curious on which part of the rebate. You know, as part of Senate, Senate Bill 1383, local governments are required to purchase mulch and compost that is processed in a certain way that is approved by the state. So I believe that might be getting to the question that's asked. Um, if the rebate's related to maybe equipment to help somebody who's interested in community composting, I know a lot of local governments do that. We do that, you know, helping to provide and reduce the cost for those bins and kind of more of those residential community type aspects. So I, I hope I answered the, the audience member's question, but let me know if there's more details. Yeah, and it was, I should have added this, specifically address the cost of distributing compost and, and mulch. So yeah, you're right. And um, and I'll just say, you know, we used to say in the recycling field, if you're not buying back recycled content products, you're not closing the full recycling loop. So clearly, you know, government at all levels can help drive the market by purchasing back these products. Um, there was a question actually on, on the point of purchasing, Tyler, for the zoning, why, <laughs> It was just limited, like, you know, why community groups couldn't sell it, but they could allow to distribute. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, it was just, you know, to help kind of manage the, the scale, the traffic and the type of activity. We do have many opportunities that have very low thresholds for community groups that want to do a more commercial based opportunity. Um, so we wanted to allow that donation, that movement out of the compost to help, you know, kind of manage the site conditions. You know, you can't hold on to a compost 
uh, you know, maybe your community garden or farm only needs so much. And so you want to give them opportunities to be able to move that off. But we just put the commercial activities in a different bucket. Um, and for most of the commercial activities, you can still process within our changes here, you know, up to 100 cubic yards at any time with a simple over the counter form. So we're just asking you to come in, fill out a form, submit that. Um, and so we just have a different process for those who are interested in that aspect. Thank you. So we have one more minute left. I just want to let folks know that the uh, link to this recording will be made available to everybody and that when we end the webinar in a minute, uh, you'll get a pop-up survey. Uh, it does ask some demographic questions. All the questions are optional, but if you do answer, this is just helping us evaluate whether we're meeting our equity and diversity inclusivity goals. So we would appreciate that. We keep everything anonymous. We never release the data. Appreciate you participating in our survey. Um, Megan, we're not going to run that last poll. And um, I just want to thank our presenters. Round of applause for joining us today and sharing your uh, ex expertise and experience. And we look forward to amplifying your stories and getting them out and replicating them. So thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next event, everybody. Take care. Have a good fall.